So I think it's a complicated question because, um, you know, first you have to kind of start with what is malware? Um, and from the perspective of somebody trying to guard a large organization or working in or protect the information security of a, an enterprise system or network, um, it kind of has to be looked at like any piece of software that's vulnerable, coded badly, could be exploited, um, or malicious in nature, uh, or even something like um, incorrect configurations that put the organization at risk. Um, and there's, there's a lot of all of that, so it's a huge risk for, for us, and I think for most organizations. Um, now, I think when you talk about software that is intentionally malicious in nature, um, we don't, um, it's hard to differentiate. It's hard to tell sometimes. And, and sometimes it doesn't matter. Um, what, what I look for in my day to day is, um, just things that have the potential to, um, to affect the availability of our systems for our users for the most part. Of course, we want to keep confidential data um, confidential. Uh, we want to maintain the integrity of the data. Uh, but the, the main thing that we lose sleep over is people not being able to access what they need to access um, for class tomorrow. Um, so on a larger sense, I think malware is probably a close second to social engineering or phishing in terms of like one of the most dangerous threats that an organization has to deal with. Unfortunately, what we see from the automated systems and the antivirus software is a lot of false positives, like an overwhelming amount of false positives. So being able to sort the signal from the noise is very important. And it comes with an understanding of the much larger threat appetite or risk appetite of the organization and how that organization conducts business, what what's important, what's essential, what's critical for that organization and being able to act quickly and appropriately on the fly um, to protect those essential business functions. Yes and no. The antivirus solutions have become both good and bad in the sense that a lot of them can very effectively eliminate a lot of the low hanging fruit. So for example, um, if you were to download, say something like, uh, Oath crack, um, like a password cracker that everybody knows about. It's a tool that everybody reads about when they're studying for this. Um, it's going to usually get quarantined before it ever hits the end user system. Ideally, at the firewall, at the email servers, um, before it gets to the antivirus for the local PC. But as a last resort, the local PC will usually, uh, that antivirus program will quarantine it, and then you can take the appropriate action from there. Um, what it's not so good at, at this time, is being able to accurately assess the the more advanced threats, the, the polymorphic malware um, that changes every time or that's brand new. Um, and also it can't really differentiate between uh, programs that are not malicious in nature, but just coded badly um, or just intended functionality a lot of times. A lot of a lot of the software that we have to run for better or for worse is behaves a lot like malware. And if you put it up on virus total or throw it against your virus scanners, put it in a sandbox and detonate it, it'll try to tell you that it's malware in one degree or another. Um, that's when you have to like really use your knowledge of the business and your understanding of the environment to make a judgment call. Um, and you know, you can, you can take other steps like, um, isolating that system on its own VLAN with the, with the appropriate ACLs in place, um, to kind of 
put it on its own network segment and, and keep the other system safe if need be. But usually it's something we have to run. Um, for example, in our environment, there's a testing, um, a testing vendor that just runs real bad code um, and requires real bad programs to be along to, to be installed as um, prerequisites, like real old Java, real old Flash Player. Um, and as anybody that's been in this industry or been studying this for long knows, those are basically back doors to anybody that knows what they're doing um, and wants to get at them. Um, so we have to be able to mitigate risks like that to the point where the business can deal with um, the the risk and accept the, the remaining risk, the remaining risk, uh, the risk that's left over. It depends on how you define reliable. There are a lot of false positives. The overwhelming majority of the alerts that we deal with daily are technically false positives. But you have to get into what what's useful to you as an analyst or um, as a threat researcher for your organization. Um, and what's useful more than whether a particular piece of software is malicious or not in nature is what kind of threat it represents to the organization. What are the trends on a daily, weekly, monthly basis? Yeah, so I think that even though we get a lot of false positives, watching those false positives ebb and flow and, and come in and, and repeat themselves um, gives us a really complex understanding of when things are abnormal to the point that we need to be concerned or um, if something comes in that just lights up the, uh, the virus scanner, the, the, the scanning engines like a Christmas tree, um, we don't automatically panic. We're not automatically pulling servers. We're not automatically um, shutting down VLANs, nothing like that for the most part. Um, and we can very quickly, or at least in time with experience, um, learn to differentiate serious threats from um, just normal uh, problems that we have to deal with and mitigate in a way that's appropriate to our environment. Uh, we've had problems in the past with people that come in straight out of an academic environment or a more risk averse organization, say like hospital, hospitals, military, um, and they wanna take more extreme action. Um, and some of them can't really be trained out of it. You know, they wanna, uh, just batten down all the hatches and go full shields up defense, but that's not the reality that we operate in. Um, while we, we always want to increase our defensive capabilities, increase the safety of our environment, we can't do it at the expense of the end user's ability to do what they need to do. Um, that always comes first in our environment. And depending on which, which field, which industry you're in, what kind of organization you work for, even who's running it at any given time, all of that changes. So the algorithm changes and it takes um, a bit of experience, patience, um, and a, a level head to react appropriately to everything that happens um, and, and be consistent in that manner in a way that your, your organization uh, benefits from over the long run. My preferred malware scanner is going to be the one that the the users will use or can use um, and the one that works intuitively or automatically that they don't have to think a whole lot about for it to be effective for them. So I, I'm a big advocate for just like in, in Windows land Defender because it's bundled with Windows and people don't have to go purchase something else. They don't have to maintain licensing. Um, now you can debate the merits of the actual software, um, but 
you know, at the end of the day, it does a pretty good job for most people at eliminating those low hanging fruits, the big threats that like have, you know, recognized hash values to represent them. You know, that um, it does a good job at that sort of thing and it does it quickly and effectively. And, you know, beyond that, I personally, I use Cisco AMP uh, or Secure Endpoint as it's called now. And I like a lot of the aspects of that software. Um, it too has its problems, of course, but one of the really interesting features about Cisco Secure Endpoint is it gives you a file traje trajectory where you can um, very quickly access everything a machine was doing at a given moment and see it in a timeline. So if a given uh, program downloads an executable and a given user runs it, you see all that happen and everything that happens after, and you can trace an event back um, to its source and really get a good idea um, what you need to do about that system right then and there. Um, and it gives you the ability to isolate it remotely, um, completely cut off network access, and then worry about it later. Um, in our environment, we have it's also cloud-based. So in our environment, we have students that'll take laptops home. Um, we have a way for them to rent a laptop for an entire term and it's free to them. And they're total, they're admins on those machines, um, which are domain joined. So that's a big problem for us, um, but they have to be able to do that so they can install the software they need. But what, what we actually find is that as soon as those machines leave, they get malware. Um, that's one of the biggest causes of, of our alerts is those machines that are in, in the possession of students that are running as admins on those machines. Um, they all get malware almost immediately. So, you know, that, that really helps to highlight, um, why that's a bad idea, but also it gives us leverage with the business and the IT directors to say, hey, when these machines come back to campus, they need to get re-imaged immediately, um, ideally without touching the network. So it, and you know, we have the data to back up that that's a, that's a step that needs to be taken every time without fail. Um, so Cisco AMP's good. All of the, the problem with a lot of the commercial uh, anti-malware services or, or antiviruses is that they begin to themselves act like malware at some point um, because of the marketing, because of the advertising, or because of just the amount of how resource intensive they are. Some of them change to be more noisy or loud um, or annoying after the licensing runs out on a trial period, for example. Um, some of them don't appropriately um, deactivate the native malware so that it causes conflicts and they can kind of fight each other and consume an exorbitant amount of system resources. Um, so for those reasons, for home use, I usually, and people that aren't super tech savvy or, you know, just use their, their machines personally for personal stuff. Um, I usually just recommend they stick with whatever comes with their OS and make sure that it stays updated. My strategy, ideally, is to re-image the machine. Um, what we try to do in our environment is to set up our systems in such a way that anybody's machine can be re-imaged at any time without significant loss of productivity on their part. It's not a huge inconvenience to the user. You can do it 24-7 over the network with the Pixie Boot, um, and that gives us a lot of it saves us a lot of time because to try to get into, well, what malware is this? How do we remove it fully and make sure the user is safe to go out there and keep using the device that might, you know, they might be tr transmitting sensitive, you know, student data all the time. Um, so the safest way for us is just to re-image the machine. Um, yeah, there's a very low probability that um, we could encounter some kind of rootkit that would persist through uh, 
a wipe of the drive and a re-image of the operating system. But in practical, um, in practice, we don't really see that. Um, what we see is a lot of pop-ups that are usually browser-based, um, just JavaScript that is real loud and annoying and scary looking for the user, but probably doesn't even install anything. Um, and, you know, usually it's, it doesn't even persist through a reboot, but if we, but we want to be safe. And the easiest way to do that is to spend, you know, the 20 or 30 minutes re-imaging the machine. And, um, we don't have to worry about it for the most part. Um, of course we keep our, our antivirus running before and after, and we can, we can watch the machine to see what it's doing on the network. Um, the first step, obviously, if, if you suspect malware is to isolate the machine, um, and keep it from infecting other hosts on the network. But what we tend to do is just, um, re-image it if we can. Um, if it's a server, we, we keep, uh, snapshots consistent, consistently make snapshots, um, and we'll just revert to the latest snapshot. Um, we keep just full backups of, of just everything. So there's a lot of redundancy built in so that we can always um, flash back to a known good configuration in whatever system we're dealing with. So for the most part, we avoid uh, removing malware specifically um, and continuing with that operating system as it is. Um, we just redo it. Um, that, that avoids a lot of unnecessary risk later, I think. Well, again, it, dep it depends on what you're dealing with. You know, if, if somebody's got confidential information on their machine that you're afraid might get exfiltrated, um, sold on, on the dark web, um, off, you know, maybe they get ransomware that, that locks all their stuff up and demands payment. Um, because of the nature of the business that I'm in currently, we don't really have to um, pay ransoms like that. We just nuke the machines um, and start over with them. So we try to make sure that users don't have anything that isn't backed up elsewhere to the cloud, um, to network storage, whatever we need to do to make sure that a ransomware, even if successful in executing, isn't going to um, cause some sort of situation where we can't get to the data we need or we're worried about um, student data. Now, you know, if you actually needed to remove the malware, um, obviously it can spread to other machines. Um, it can lock things up. It can wipe machines or render them inoperable. It can cause a lot of problems on your network, depending on what kind of IOT, HVAC, you know, all these systems, uh, fire alarms, 911, all these systems are tied into the network one way or another. And uh, it gets to be a dangerous kind of cat and mouse game that we don't have the resources to play. Um, yeah, we have cybersecurity insurance. We have uh, expert MSPs that we could call in the event of a cybersecurity emergency to get, you know, actual forensic like boots on the ground to really um, dig in. But we prefer to like nip that in the bud way ahead of time by just immediately isolating and uh, reformatting that machine, re-imaging it on the spot, because that that helps us remove a lot of the liability that comes from later in the process, if you decide to go down that road. Um, it's kind of a dangerous game and you have to have the right resources or tools, capabilities, and experts to deal with that. Um, and a lot of organizations just don't. Yeah. Um, one of the things I try to do is always keep a home lab. Um, and it's important to do that on its own network segment behind its own firewall. Um, so 
um, I'll have a, a server running um, a hypervisor software and then within that I'll put several machines um, Windows 10 Windows 11 some sort of um, like Red Hat Linux um, or CentOS um, and then like another machine with Kali um, maybe a Mac OS machine um, if I can swing it and what I do is just kind of red team blue team against myself in a sense so I'll execute malware in these sandbox environments and see what happens so um, one of the tools that I've used um, to watch this and it's kind of something that doesn't usually get mentioned in this um, in this context is a tool called MCO, which is actually originally designed to um, bun rebundle or repackage installers in MSI format for Windows environments like when you're trying to deploy software to Windows domains uh, through SCCM and what that does is it, it records everything the the machine does um, so like you can really get a good idea um, during um, an installation of a software what else it's doing besides what it says it's doing. So a lot of times we'll get requests for people to down, you know, we get people that ask us to unblock soft, like sites that host software uh, that's usually from a third party, second or third party, not the original manufacturer. Um, we don't do that because that's a, a real good way to get infected with malware because people will use these as kind of a Trojan horse to sneak their their malware onto, the, onto our systems because when we execute it from SCCM or from the system administration perspective, we execute with full admin powers. Um, and they can they can do whatever they want at that point they have root so to speak uh, so you know there are a lot of tools out there um, the main you know I use Proxmox um, and I uh, Gydra is kind of changed the game because it, it kind of gave everybody the capabilities of Ida uh, for free which is fantastic um, you know uh, process monitor is invaluable um, Process Hacker is a good one. Um, it, it also depends on the, the operating system, of course. I also like to um, like do exploits from, from Kali, from Metasploit, um, and just you know, see if I can catch uh, Netstat AN is really good on a Windows machine. Um, just to try to catch what's going on before it becomes problematic or as it happens before um, you know that infection or vulnerability or exploit has a chance to spread or um, grow out of your control we'll just dive in you know um, when I first started working on the malware side of our information security department um, I was not a programmer um, not a reverse engineer uh, not a malware analyst I I just knew how to find the alerts and close them or start investigating from there and it's just a a process of you know getting getting your feet wet and and learning from where you are um, and the more you can understand about how your business operates and what its risk tolerance is what its primary motivations are, like what the business model is, what you're trying to do, what the mission statement is. Um, all of that really helps being an effective um, threat hunter or um, I guess cybersecurity analyst, malware analyst for your organization to know how to respond appropriately. Um, now, when you start learning about this stuff, if that's your goal as you're training, try to be as well-rounded as possible. You have to know networking. Um, it helps to know IT support, um, system administration, um, and then, you know, programming, of course, as early as possible 
if you're going to end up trying to be an actual malware analyst. Um, it gets, you know, get good at programming as soon as you can. Uh, because, you know, myself, I came to that late and had to play catch up to understand what was going on in source code. Um, but, you know, you, you capture samples as you go. So each, you know, true positive that you get, you can usually, you know, get a sample, uh, fetch the file. And then, um, like Cisco has a threat grid, used to be threat grid. Now it's um, malware analytics, I believe. I could be wrong about that name. They've got a bunch of different things, but the, the one I'm thinking of, the formerly threat grid, allows you to detonate malware in a sandbox that Cisco controls and watch it execute and see everything that goes on much in the way that MCO does on a local machine. Um, and then it gives you an analysis of everything that happened and um, behaviorally too, just to know like how malicious is this behavior in and of itself or potentially malicious. And you know, that's where you start getting into um, a lot of these softwares that are just programmed badly or vulnerable by nature. Uh, like for example, we have lockdown browsers in our environment and they're used to monitor students taking tests so that they can be prevented from cheating in theory. Um, but these, these programs have to act a lot like malware because they kind of seize control of everything that's going on and report it to a third party on the internet. Um, so, you know, that's something that has to kind of be isolated or, or dealt with kind of carefully to understand that, no, it's not malware. Yes, it behaves like malware. Yes, we have to have it, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it. Um, that sort of thing is our bread and butter to be able to do that. Um, and then we have different sides of the house, like the, the cybersecurity department has to be able to do a lot of shady things on their network segment. Um, so understanding that business context um, is really important. Just try to learn as much as you can uh, and be as well-rounded as you can in IT. Um, databases, another big one that's really important. Web development, if you can. Um, but like, try to spend as much time as you can getting to know the, the field that you wanna work cybersecurity in. If you can get started with an internship in IT support or system or network administration, even programming, um, before you move into cybersecurity, that'll help you do your job better when you're actually trying to protect the organization from cyber threats. I've got a funny story and then a more serious one. Um, the funny story is when I was working the help desk, one of our guys, um, and he's still a friend of mine to this day, and he's an exceptional programmer, has been doing it his whole life um, since probably the 70s, and he's just amazing. Um, he lacks in a lot of other areas that, um, you know, causes him problems with being able to work in a professional IT environment. But he, as far as his coding ability and raw technical ability, he's just brilliant. So what he did was come up with this full program that, um, basically, um, would take a variety of input and cause a blue screen on, on the machine. Um, and then when somebody tried to kind of figure out what, what was going on, it would go away. So, um, you know, periodically throughout the day, people would be trying to work on this machine and it would blue screen. And then when they try to take a screenshot or anything else to get the error, um, it just disappear. Um, and we spent a lot of time kind of assuming that machine was infected at first and then trying to troubleshoot it only to find out that he was just playing a prank, um, which probably kind of lost a lot of labor hours for um, the help desk at that time in that place. Um, but it was hilarious. And uh, it's just another example of one of those situations where um, 
you know, even a prank can cause what the business would consider to be lost um, revenue or um, productivity. Um, and that sort of thing would probably get him in a lot of trouble if it were done today. The, the whole environment is different. Back then it was a lot more. Um, we had a lot of free reign to um, explore and develop ourselves as, as techs, as um, people who were just getting their feet wet in the industry and growing into their careers. Um, so that was a really nice thing um, then at that time just for to see because uh, it did kind of get out of hand a bit even though it was originally intended just to be a prank. Um, now, as far as more serious concerns, I guess I have two stories. There's, there was one malware that got put on the SOIT network, the, the School of Information Technology network, um, that was a cryptocurrency, cryptocurrency miner. And we all didn't know how it got there, but just one day it was on pretty much all the computers in the in the wing and all of them were just mining cryptocurrency all day every day it turns out that was one of the students at the time and uh, you know a, a few of us figured out who specifically um, because you know we were all kind of going through the program at the same time um, and you know too many people at the time had admin um, capabilities on those computers. So we ended up having to wipe all the computers um, and re-image them, which was difficult at that time in that environment because they didn't have a, a mature um, software deployment system set up. They didn't have SCCN, they didn't even have WDS. They were deploying images from flash drives. Um, so that, that was quite labor intensive and quite a problem um, caused by just a curious student that wanted to, I don't know, make some money on the side. That student could have been expelled, but I don't think anybody ever name dropped him. Uh, so he's still out there, probably still working in the industry somewhere. Um, and it was clever what he did. I don't know if he ever made any money off of it because I don't think the back end uh, of that idea really works out. Um, you know, as far as like unintentional, um, loss of availability or misconfiguration malware. Um, I've had situations where, you know, when I was an intern and like in charge of my first network, um, I think everybody that's gone through this uh, has probably brought down a network at one time or another accidentally. And you have that kind of, um, that panic moment where you know, you you've got to stay until it's fixed. Um, and people are coming in at eight o'clock in the morning expecting to use everything in this network. And that's like, if it's not there for them, if it's not available, um, there will be repercussions at that point. So if it's like five o'clock in the afternoon, you're expecting to go home and you break the network, you bought it, you're there till it's done. So I've had, real late nights and, and actually, you know, slept, um, at work, uh, after that sort of situation where I was the only one there, um, and the only one that could fix it. Um, and that's just nothing malicious, but you know, misconfiguration is just as serious of a problem. So it, it kind of goes back to show that malware it's, it varies from organization to organization, what you can consider malware. Um, and it, you know, it, what, what it really comes down to, I guess, is what's, what's the potential implications for the end users or the organization? How much risk does it expose them to? And how do you mitigate that risk in a manner that's appropriate for the environment? Um, so the good thing about me learning that environment learning that lesson in a very controlled environment that was uh, very limited in scope was that you know later i knew not to test in prod right um, if you're going to make big changes you know you do that in your sandbox environment if you're going to test 
detonating malware or something, you do that in your sandbox environment, which has been very carefully isolated from everything that's important. Um, you know, with a lot of the malware these days, you have to worry about it. You can't just run it in a, sand, uh, in a virtual machine on your work computer. It can escape that. Um, you even have to build the virtual machines in such a way as to resemble real computers. You know, the appropriate amount of RAM, the appropriate amount of hard drive space, the appropriate amount of processor cores, because that stuff can figure out that it's in a sandbox and get out. Uh, so hopefully those three little anecdotes are helpful to somebody out there. But yeah, if you're going to make big mistakes and bring down networks, do it while you're still um, young and in training and when the scope is limited and not um, as as we used to call it a resume generating event i.e you're going to have to update your resume um, if you make this mistake in production that comes later <laughs>